There was a king in Israel, a king by the name of Ahab, and King Ahab looked across his city one day and saw a vineyard he really liked, the vineyard of Naboth. And so he went to Naboth and made him an offer, and Naboth said, nope, I want to keep it. And uh, King Ahab went home and he pouted, because that's what you do sometimes, you pout. And uh, his queen, Queen Jezebel, yes, that Jezebel, came to him and said, why are you pouting? Let's see what we can get worked out. And so Queen Jezebel and King Ahab arranged for Naboth, who owned the vineyard, to be the uh, guest of honor at a feast. And they talked to the two people who were going to sit on the left and the right of Naboth. And they told these two fellows to uh, testify after the feast that Naboth had blasphemed against God. And that's what happened. And because two people were willing to get up in court and proclaim that Naboth had blasphemed before God, Naboth was put to death, and King Ahab got his vineyard. The word of God for us, the people of God. Isn't that great news, right? One of the more uplifting stories of Scripture. I hope the wine was very bitter for King Ahab. The commandment against theft and the commandment against lying are back to back for reasons that become obvious when you start looking at acts like this. When King Ahab starts to steal a vineyard, what does he have to do to get away with it? Lie. Right? As soon as you start breaking any of the other commandments, you're going to start lying pretty quickly. Did, did, did you uh, start stealing? No, no, I didn't steal that. Have you committed adultery? Nope. Are you taking good par care of your parents? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm taking good care of my parents. Right? As soon as you start breaking any other commandment, the next thing you're going to have to do is lie. Right, it's woven into the rest of them. We're going to begin by looking at the most specific form of lying that this commandment looks at. Uh, it talks about not bearing false witness, which is obviously a, a jurisdictional, a judicial uh, situation in courts. But then we're going to go look at, uh, from there, lying out of a misguided sense of love. And that most intriguing of categories that is neither truth nor lie, but is BS. And you can figure out what that stands for by yourself. The court, first, is the place where the community gathers uh, to discern what is true in the moment when, um, when everything's on the line, right? When you get together, when you're in court, no one's there because they're excited to be. People are in court because something has gone wrong, something has happened. And so in that moment when justice is being determined, there must be absolute certainty that truth will be told or else the, the trust of the community in the courts breaks down. The danger in the lying in courts is not just to the health of the community either. It's the danger to the person who's in the dock, right? Especially if you're poor or you're unpopular. If you're in the dock, you're being charged, you're at risk. Your life, the rest of your life could go poof or your life could end. And so uh, there's a, even to this day, people do not want to go to court. There's a 90% rate of people plea, plea bargaining in fe the federal system because they just don't want to go to court. They're scared. And, and I don't blame them. And so when the stakes are this high, the truth must be told for the good of the community and for the good of the person charged. And yet we see in the story of Naboth how this very system can be corrupted. If you just walked into court and saw Naboth being convicted, you would have thought everything was above board. Right? And so this system can be uh, corrupted and mishandled and abused, and so we, we have to attend to these things. We have to tell the truth about not just when you're in court, but tell the truth about the challenges the court faces. To praise a governor of Illinois, which is not something that happens often, admittedly. My home state does not have a good record of governors, but uh, a lot of them end up in prison. But one of them, George Ryan, who, who did end up in prison, before he went to prison, he uh, commuted 160 life, uh, people on death row, row to life sentences. And he did it because in the 300 capital cases that occurred while he was governor, half of them were, were reversed. A failure rate of one half of all mer of death penalty cases in Illinois were reversed while he was governor. 33 of the defendants who were on death row of those 300, their lawyers were later disbarred or stopped from practicing law ever again. Right? And two-thirds of those folks were African-American. And I can tell you, because I lived there, two-thirds of Illinois is not black. All right? That's not the race. That's a, it's a scary ratio. It, looking at a more broad uh, sense, if you look across the other states, you get into places like Louisiana, where if you kill a white person, you're twice as likely to get the death penalty as if you kill a minority. 
three times more likely in California, three and a half times more likely in North Carolina. If you kill a white person, you are three and a half times more likely to get the death penalty than if you kill a black, a Mexican, an immigrant, a Chinese, anyone else. So, uh, and then you throw in the fact that we're averaging right now five exonerations a year nas nationally, so five times a year that someone is found innocent, and Governor George Ryan looked at this system and he told the truth. It's broken. We can't trust our court system to administer the death penalty. So we should stop. Right? And so he, he, exon he uh, commuted those 160 and, uh, because he'd seen if you can't afford a good lawyer, if you've killed a white person, you are far more likely to end up on death row. In courts, we have to have confidence that what is being decided is for the good of the community. And what we start to see is uh, the need for, well, what we find in Deuteronomy 17, where it says, on the evidence of two or three witnesses, the death sentence shall be executed. A person must not be put to death on the evidence of only one witness. 44 of those 300 cases where people were convicted uh, were convicted by one prison snitch. You can put someone on death row by one prison snitch? And, uh, and then it goes a little bit further, and this is where I, I kind of like it. And it says, the hands of the witness shall be the first raised against the person to execute the death penalty. And then afterwards, the hands of all the other people. People are stoned to death in that day. And so there's sort of a check on this. You can get up and say something is true in court, but if you, you think it's going to lead to the death penalty, you can't just say it. You've got to be willing to throw the first stone. Truth is not just something you say, it's something you have to be willing to act on, or else did you really believe it? Right? I appreciate that. Now, I don't think anyone here is likely to be involved in a capital death penalty case anytime uh, soon, which is a good thing. So we move on to the next type of situation where lies are commonly told when we know something and we don't say it because it wouldn't be nice. Right, what's that great phrase? If you can't say something nice, you're such good Midwesterners, right? You are, you're great. Right? If you can't say something nice, don't say something at all. Why does this happen? It happens because if, we are, if, we, if our love for other people is not grounded in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we can end up being nice because we don't know what else to be. If we don't have a firm root, root, uh, groundedness in, in the importance and ability of repentance, the ability to forgive, the ability to be, for people to be transformed, we're just going to be nice because we've got nothing else to say. And, and I'll tell you that the two groups of people who are most tempted to do this, uh, doctors, nurses, and, and pastors. Doctors and nurses, uh, I, I, I've seen this temptation where they won't tell you how bad you really are. Why? Because they, they think you can't handle it, right? And, and so what happens is people who are uh, suffering, are, are, uh, they're worse off than they think. They, they miss this opportunity to reconcile with family, to put their affairs in order, to get right with God. Right? Or worse, this is what happens more with the, the nurses. I see nurses who will do everything they can to keep someone uh, looking good when the family shows up and so that they, they don't, the family doesn't see how badly they suffer uh, when the family isn't there. Right? And so what might be worse is people live in pain because the family doesn't realize how hard it is. We can keep people alive for a long time, longer than maybe we ought sometimes. Uh, the, Job, from the book of Job, actually comments on this when he uh, looks at his three friends who are giving him flack. He, he accuses them of being a, as worthless physicians who whitewash over things. Right? And that, that's the accusation here. You're whitewashing over things, you're pretending it's nicer, when really it's not. Right? The same thing happens with, with pastors, my own profession, that um, I can't tell you how many times I've heard other pastors say, I, I don't think the people could handle it if I told them this, so people, again, whitewash over things and, and don't say what's needed. Like, for example, Jesus called disciples, plural, and if you're not gathering with other disciples, plural, in Jesus' name on a regular basis, you're not following Jesus. Jesus says, follow me. If you're not gathering with other people to worship Jesus, you know what you're doing? You're admiring Jesus. And that's nice, but it's not following Jesus. Right? If you're going to follow Jesus, following Jesus is a team sport. But it's much more tempting to say, you know what, you can just follow Jesus by yourself however you want. No. 
No, that doesn't actually really work. This temptation hits everyone, especially when it comes to our family, right? Because we don't want to rock the boat. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all, especially if it's something talking to your parents or your in-laws, because it's, it's just safer that way, right? It's just safer. We don't dare speak the truth to others, whether they be friends or family, because we're afraid that if we do dare speak the truth, that uh, the relationship might be broken. But in doing so, we leave people sin sick and miserable because they don't hear that there's a better way. So lying in court, that try not to. Uh, being nice, well, you know, truth is more important than nice. But I want to move on to this, this third chunk of uh, what we're looking at today, which is something that is actually worse than lying or telling the truth, and that's bull. BS, right? We all know what that stands for. You can figure it out yourself. But bull, what's the difference between lying and BS? Right? Think about it. What's the difference? If someone lies, what do they have to figure out first? The truth. For you to be able to lie, you've got to know what the truth is and then pick something else. Right? So the person who lies at least knows what truth is. What's the so when someone's BSing you, they don't care what the truth is. They're just trying to look good. Right? The person who BSs is actually worse than the liar because they're just lazy. They're not willing to put in the effort to figure out what, tr what truth is or even what a lie is. They just want to look good. We see this when we have uh, Pilate, right? Pilate is speaking to Jesus, and Pilate has Jesus' hands in, in, in his control, has Jesus' life in his hands. And um, they're having this very serious discussion, and Jesus is saying, my kingdom's not of this world, I came to testify to truth, to show truth, to live truth, and what's Pilate's response? What's truth? Now, if he asked what's truth and then began a serious discussion, sat down, brewed some coffee, and we, they chewed on it, can you ha proclaim tr truth, Jesus? What does it mean for you to be truth? I'm a Roman official. If they really got into it, I would respect Pilate. But he didn't. What did he say? He said, what's truth? Ah, what's truth? And then he went to the, the balcony, spoke to the crowds, and said, what do you want? You want Barabbas? You want Jesus? Eh, what do, what's he doing? He's BSing. He's just giving people what they want. Right? This is the sin we, we suspect p politicians of. They're not saying what's right. They're not saying what's wrong. They're just keeping the crowd happy. They're just telling you what they think you want to hear. That, that, that's the sin we, we suspect politicians of. And uh, somehow we don't hold them to uh, their feet to the fire. We, we, you know, and the danger of BS is that um, you know, even a broken clock is right twice a day. And, and someone who's speaking BS and just wants to look good might be right. But the danger is it breaks down our trust in leaders. It breaks down our trust in each other. And, and I think we're starting to see that response because who, who are the most popular people in the, in the Republican field right now, of Republican field for, can, for presidents, right? It's the outsiders. It's the non-politicians. It's the people you look at and say, you know what, Trump might be a jerk. Ben Carson's a doctor. Carly, Fi Carly Fiorina, if I get that right, ran a company. She didn't run it particularly well, honestly. But you know what they're not? They're not politicians, and politicians give us a load of BS, and we're tired of it. And so we're looking for someone, at least they're giving it to us straight. I think we're seeing that response right now. If you want to know more about BS, there's a guy named uh, Dr. Frankfurt who, who wrote a little book on it. You can sit down and read it in one sitting. It's, it's amazing. But it really lays out. BS is wrong. It's evil. It breaks our community because it is lazy. Now before we get into it, what it takes to be a community that tells and lives truth, I do need to... Uh, give you two examples in the Bible where lying is praised two times. Once when the um, Hebrew midwives, it, when the J Hebrew people are in slavery, they are told that they should kill every newborn, every infant male. A and when the Egyptians guards show up with their swords drawn ready to start killing children, the, the Hebrew midwives say, you know those Hebrew women, they just have kids fast. We can't get to them in time. Right? They're lying, but they save children. Another time, uh, Rahab, uh, the, in uh, Rahab shelters, when, when Joshua is leading the people into the promised land, he sends out spies, and, and Rahab shelters two of them in a city, and when the guards knock on the door asking where the spies are, Rahab says, I don't know, I haven't seen any spies. And so if you have someone at your door knocking at your door with a sword drawn ready to kill someone, lie. That, that's okay. 
Otherwise, tell the truth. But if someone pulls a sword, maybe that's the time to... Yeah. <laughs> now, what does it take to tell the truth? First, we have to believe that there is such a thing as truth. And we also have to believe that it might not be obvious. One of the first things about being able to find truth is being able to say, I don't know. But Jesus says he sends the Holy Spirit who will guide us into all truth. And if you're being guided into all truth, what's that imply? You're not there yet. Right? You're on a journey. We're on our way towards all truth. But we, there are going to be times when we say, we don't know. We're sure there is truth, but we don't know what it is yet. And this journey is going to take a community gathering together, a community that rejects BS, that, that says it will take effort to seek out truth, and then comes together to compare notes, to listen to each other's experiences, to ask questions, and to seek answers. And because sometimes truth gets kind of squirrely. You experience something some way, and other person experiences it differently. And you have to sit down and ask, well, what happened there? For example, if someone's hurt in a situation, someone's bothered, someone's been offended, and you have to sit down with that person, and I was offended by this. Well, I didn't mean to offend. You have to have that conversation about what, was, what offense was meant, what offense was intended, what offense was actually occurred, why did it occur. I mean, and these type of discussions are challenging. Because what do, you, what do you want to say? If someone offends you and you just don't want to deal with it, what, do you, what are you tempted to say? It's okay. Right? It's fine. Don't worry about it. And, and that's BS. Right? It's, if, if you're offended, you're offended. You just can't gloss over it and say, no, no, it's, it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's Midwestern nice. Right? It takes a community to gather together to seek the truth together. And this, we see this in how Jesus talks about how he came to testify to the truth. God did not write the letters of truth and dig words in the sky. God sent his son to live truth among people. Right? It takes a community gathered living together, taking risks and asking questions, qu uh, having doubts, saying things that might be uncomfortable, but saying them as Paul expresses in love, sa sa speaking the truth in love. And what does it take to speak the truth in love? The person to whom you are speaking when you're speaking the truth in love has to be absolutely certain that the next time you see them that you're going to smile. Right? That no matter what you say, they have, to be, they have to just know that next time you see them that you are, they, that person is going to be just as welcome, just as much a friend, just as loved as they are no matter what happens next. There are people to whom I would love to say things, but they don't know how much I love them, so I can't say them. Right? I haven't, sh I haven't expressed, I haven't shown, I haven't served those people enough for them to know how much I love them. And until I love them, until they know how much I love them, they can't hear me. I can't speak in love because they, they haven't experienced that love, right? So there are going to be times when you want to say something, but until you've loved on that person, can't. Can't speak truth. Not, not yet. Ephesians, uh, Paul writes in Ephesians, he goes on saying, Speak the truth in love, growing up in every way into him who is the head, the Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which is, is equipped as, as each part is working properly. Did you hear how he goes from speaking the truth to how Christ is the head of the body that we are all knit together in? We can't speak truth unless we're knit together as the body of Christ. We're all in this together. So put away falsehood. Let us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit, but put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving, as Christ has forgiven you. And so what does it take to speak the truth in love? It takes avoiding slander, avoiding bitterness, avoiding anger, forgiving, being kind. Even when we go to each other, when we have sin, Matthew 18, it lays out how to do it. You go one-on-one, -on -one and then you bring someone if you need help, so that there's this community discussion. You have multiple points of view, so you can figure out what is the truth of a situation where someone has been offended or hurt. <clears throat> you know, what... What Paul is laying out, what Jesus describes, is part of the reason uh, we have to deal with our seeking truth, figuring out, resolving conflict. We have to figure it out one-on-one. -on -one because Have you ever sent someone to figure it out for you? You ever say to someone, hey, can you go talk to this person because they hurt me, they, they, they hacked me off, but I can't go talk to them. So can you go talk to them? You ever do that? 
You know, what, what's that, what does that imply? What, what's the message of that? The message is that you don't trust this person enough to go talk to them face to face. You're going to send someone else because you don't really... You can say to someone, I need you to go with me, but you can't say to someone, can you go for me? Because if you're the person who needs to speak truth, you're the one who has to speak it. And, and this is especially true that... This is going to speak from my own personal experience here. This is especially true when it comes to pastors, when it comes to anonymous sort of feedback, because it's happened. I've been a pastor for nine years now, and at times I've gotten anonymous feedback. And you know what? The, the worst case scenario when a pastor gets anonymous feedback, someone goes to PPR, and PPR comes to the pastor and says, hey, so this thing has happened. The worst thing that happens is I've got to stand up here every week and look at you, right? And if I start getting anonymous feedback, there's a problem. I look at you, and I don't know which one of you is stirring the pot. I don't know which one of you is causing problems. And it breaks down my ability to trust you. And it makes it a lot harder for me to love you. Right? That's the worst thing that happens. Right? And the best thing that can happen is the PPR uh, then takes the anonymous uh, feedback and doesn't do anything with it because they don't want to damage the relationship between the pastor and the church. But then, does anything ever get resolved? No. And so, it's an, it again gets back to the whole community thing. If you can't trust your pastor to sit down and work something out, community's got a problem, doesn't it? Right? We, we're in this together. And if we have a challenge, it's a bit of a personal plea, but we're going to seek truth together. We've got to do it together. Eye to eye with a cup of coffee or whatever you'd like to sip on. My friends, we are called to be a community that dares to tell the truth, that trusts each other enough to take that risk, to do the hard work of discernment, of listening, of seeking the truth, even when it means naming sin, even when it means being a little bit less than nice. But i got to tell you, it's worth it. And I can tell you when it was worth it, because it just happened right back there. Right back in that corner, a few weeks ago, you all know Phyllis was diagnosed with cancer. And I was honored to be back there as Phyllis went back and chatted with Dale. Dale, I already asked Phyllis's permission to talk about this. I'm bragging on you, so I, I figured you'd be okay with it. But um, I was able to be there when a patient and a doctor had a conversation. And it wasn't Mrs. Rainbow talking to Dr. S. Meyer. It was Phyllis and Dale talking about something that mattered. And they could tell the truth to each other, and they could talk about it, and they believe together, and they hope in the same Lord, and at the end of it we could pray together, and it was good. It was powerful. It was profound. We can tell the truth to each other, and it's worth it, because then we can become the community that leans on each other, that trusts each other that hopes in each other, that sees the good in each other, and is willing to name what is broken. And once you can name what's broken, then it can be fixed by the grace of God. Amen. We now come to a time when we confess when we have been nice instead of honest. And so let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved